the greatest unresolved mysteries of the world can almost sound like blockbuster movie plots, secret treasure hunts, museum heists, and giant magnets in space are just a few of the unsolved cases that give us goosebumps. If you're looking for weird incidents that don't make sense to keep you up at night, look no further. From internet sleuths to history buffs, these head-scratching unsolved mysteries have left many frustrated, still searching for answers even centuries later. Buckle your seatbelt and get ready for some of the strangest cases in human history, including a mysterious fog that made half the world dark for over a year in the 6th century, a murderer who secretly lived with the family he killed for six months, a missing boy who was returned to the wrong mother, and a pit of money left by pirates that supposedly curses anyone who tries to find it. If you're the type of person who lies awake at night wondering, what the heck happened to Amelia Earhart? We've got plenty of rabbit holes for you to fall down. Hey folks, before we start with today's video, remember to subscribe as it really helps the channel. Number one, the unknown culprit behind the Hintakaifek slayings may have been living in their victim's home. On March the 31st, 1922, six people were murdered at the Hintakaifek Bavarian homestead in Germany. This included the five members of the Gruber family. Andreas, his wife Casilia, their widowed daughter Victoria, and her two children, Casilia and Joseph, as well as their maid, Maria Baumgartner. A week earlier, Andreas had noticed footprints leading towards the farm from the woods, but there were no returning prints. Prior to this, Andreas had been complaining to friends and neighbors for months about hearing creaking and footsteps in the attic as well as finding a newspaper in his home that he hadn't purchased. He also revealed that the keys to his tool shed had gone missing, which happened to be the place his pickaxe, which eventually became the murder weapon, was stored. Months prior to the slaying, the Gruber's previous maid had quit, claiming the house was haunted by ghosts after hearing mysterious voices and footsteps. Not until April 4th, after young Casilia was absent from school and the mailman reported the mail piling up, were the police told to check on the Hinterkaifeck farm. Investigators interviewed over 100 suspects, some as recently as 1986, and eventually came to the conclusion that the culprit was likely living in their house for at least six months prior to the killings. There was never enough conclusive evidence to close the case, so almost a century later, it remains unsolved. Perhaps even more unsettling is the fact that livestock was still being fed and neighbors saw smoke coming from the chimney between March 31st and April 4th, indicating that the culprit remained in the house for a few days after they did away with the family. Number two. Bobby Dunbar was supposedly kidnapped, then found that the boy who returned wasn't actually Bobby. In the summer heat of August 23rd, 1912, the Dunbar family decided to cool off with a vacation to Swayze Lake in Louisiana. More swamp than lake, Swayze was full of alligators. At some point in the night, when the family was asleep in their tents, Bobby Dunbar the family's four-year-old son, wandered off and disappeared, launching an eight-month-long search for the child. A Louisiana newspaper from the time, the Corwell Watchman, covered the search. When Bobby was missed, a search traced him to the banks of Lake Swayze. At first, it was feared that he had drowned, but the lake failed to give up the body and the little boy's hat was found some distance from the lake a day or so later. With the hope of finding Bobby waning, the town continued to search for the boy, offering cash rewards equivalent to $125,000 today.
to anyone who could lead authorities to him. On April 13th, 1913, police finally thought they found little Bobby Dunbar alive, traveling with a drifter named William Cantwell Waters in Mississippi. The only problem, the Dunbars didn't recognize him. Regardless of the less-than-ideal reaction from the family, police matched up identifying markers like birthmarks to prove the boy was Bobby. The town celebrated the arrival of the missing boy, despite the Dunbar's doubts. Meanwhile, the accused kidnapper, William Cantwell Waters, protested his arrest from jail, claiming the boy was the illegitimate son of his brother and his servant. Julia Anderson, pictured, the woman who claimed to be Bobby's real mother, paid a visit to the Dunbars to claim her alleged son, Bruce Anderson. After seeing the boy, she claimed he was, in fact, little Bruce, not little Bobby. After a public trial, it was decided that the Dunbars would keep Bobby and Julia Anderson would return to Mississippi. Years later, Bobby Dunbar's granddaughter, Margaret Dunbar Cutright, received a scrapbook of articles about the mystery of her grandfather's identity. She allied with Linda Traver, granddaughter of Julia Anderson, and the two began searching for the truth. After uncovering letters and court documents, Margaret Dunbar Cutright convinced her father to give a DNA sample to finally put an end to the mystery. The DNA sample was compared to Bobby's younger brother, Alonzo. The test proved that Bobby Dunbar was not the same boy who went missing in the swamp in 1912. He was the son of Julia Anderson all along. What happened to the real Bobby Dunbar is still a mystery, as is the question of whether or not Bobby Dunbar's parents knew the boy was not really theirs. Number three, the skeleton of an unidentified woman was found stuffed in a tree. In 1943, in 1943, four teenage boys found a woman's body stuffed in a tree in the Hagley Woods in Worcestershire, England. During World War II, food rations were tight and the boys were out hunting in the hopes of finding some game to supplement their family's diet. One climbed a witch elm, named for its spooky appearance, in the hopes of finding a bird's nest, but discovered something far more sinister instead. A woman's skeleton had been stuffed into the center of the tree. The boy quickly realized the remains were human by the pieces of hair still attached to the skull. 17-year-old Tom Willits alerted the authorities, the incident weighing heavily on him. Once the body was located, Professor James Webster served as the medical examiner, estimating the woman to be 35 years old and only 5 feet tall. There were rags of clothing on her bones and fabric stuffed in her mouth, leading him to believe she may have been suffocated. He also noted that it was likely she had at one time given birth and had been deceased for around 18 months when she was found. Stranger still, her hand was missing and the bones were later discovered to be scattered around the tree. Webster concluded that the woman was murdered since the way her body was stored indicated it could not have been an accident or suicide. He also concluded that the body was put in the tree before rigor mortis caused the body to stiffen, indicating that the murder happened close to where the skeleton was found. In the investigation that followed, police contacted every local dentist, hoping to find dental records that matched the body, along with digging through missing person reports. The mysterious case went cold until six months later, when graffiti began to appear near the tree. The first chalk writing read, Who put Lubella down the witch elm? This led investigators to name their Jane Doe Bella. More and more chalk graffiti appeared with similar sentiments, making it unclear whether they were clues or taunts. 
anthropology professor Margaret Murray hypothesizes that Bella was a victim of an occult ritual. The way her hand was severed from her body appeared similar to a ritual called the Hand of Glory. Another theory was that Bella could have been a German spy, captured and slain by UK soldiers. Bella's identity and the reason for her demise remain a mystery. Number four, no trace of Amelia Earhart's plane has been found, despite extensive searches. On July 2nd, 1937, the great aviator Amelia Earhart and her navigator Fred Noonan were leaving the ground from New Guinea to finish their mission of flying around the world. Their next stop was a tiny island in the Pacific Ocean, Howland Island. The plane never arrived. Somewhere between points A and B, their radio transmission was lost, likely from overcast skies, and their fuel was dangerously low. One of the largest searches in American history followed. The U.S. Navy and Coast Guard scoured 250,000 square miles of the Pacific, but they never found Amelia Earhart, Fred Noonan, or their plane. Earhart was announced legally deceased in January 1939, over a year after her disappearance. There are many theories as to what may have happened to the great aviator. On the morning of her disappearance, Earhart said over the radio, on the line 157-337, running north and south, indicating she was, in fact, en route to Howland Island. This led to the popular hypothesis that inclement weather caused Earhart and Noonan to miss Howland Island and continue on, possibly running out of fuel and landing on a tiny island. Some even believed the two survived, living on the island as castaways. In 1940, a partial human skeleton was found on Nukumaroro, a tiny atoll, a ring of coral reef formed from an oceanic volcano. A medical examiner immediately concluded from the measurements of the bones that they belonged to a man. Decades later, scientists re-examined the measurements of the bones found on Nukumaroro in 1940. The bones themselves had been lost. Scientists concluded the human remains belonged to a woman of European descent who was the same height as Amelia Earhart and that they had more similarity to Earhart than to 99% people in a large reference sample. What happened to Earhart's plane and Fred Noonan is still unknown. Number five, no one knows what caused nine hikers' gruesome injuries in the Dyatlov Pass incident, but engineers tried to explain it. Using Disney's Frozen. In 1959, Nine hikers mysteriously perished while traveling through the Ural Mountains in former Soviet Russia. The group of mountaineers was led by 23-year-old Igor Alexeyevich Dyatlov, who was aiming to reach the peak of the mountain of Torten. The event is now known as the Dyatlov Pass incident. Dyatlov brought along eight hikers from his university sports club, told them he would send a telegram to the other members back on campus as soon as they returned from their trek. The club never received the telegram, and the nine students were never seen again. An investigation was launched, and the hikers' bodies were found within a few weeks. The strangest part of the entire incident was the state of the bodies. Investigators found brutal injuries on all of the hikers, and said the trauma was similar to that of being struck by a speeding car. One of the hikers was missing their tongue, and a few others were missing eyes. The case was quickly dismissed by the Soviet government as a result of inexperienced hikers dying of hypothermia, or possibly an avalanche. In the decades since the incident, Private investigators have been digging for the real answer to what happened. The Russian government reopened the case 
in 2019. Some have even searched for answers through the Disney animated movie Frozen. A group of engineers used the 3D animation code taken from Avalanche simulation models in Frozen to recreate the Dyatlov Pass incident in an attempt to see the injuries one would sustain if hit by an avalanche. The engineers believed the simulation added further support to the theory that an avalanche occurred as they found the phenomenon could handily break the ribs and skulls of people.